Well, hello. I want to start the same way we do every single week. I want to welcome our campuses. So those of you who are hanging out with us and watching in Racine today, we want to welcome you. Our Kenosha campus, welcome you. Our online campus, we welcome you in our beautiful Weekends on Wednesday campus. They're getting ready for this summer. This summer, we are doing happy hour like we do every year. So I think this is the second Wednesday in June. I'm doing this off the top of my head. Maybe the first. Be paying attention. We will do happy hour. It's going to be tailgating feel, which means we're going to be serving hot dogs. And uh, we're going to be having a good time all summer long. Uh, if you are joining us for the first time or it's been a while, you did join us on a great week. Because we are kicking off a brand new series today called Ripple Effect. And the big idea of this series is pretty straightforward. Here it is. The life of just one person can have far-reaching effects. Your life has the ability to have far-reaching effects. Now, if you ever watch Jimmy Fallon on a somewhat regular basis, you'll know that this segment we showed just a moment ago where people... Uh, submit bad signs. That's a pretty uh, regular thing that he's done throughout the years. But of course, we do not have to watch a segment on Jimmy Fallon to see bad signs. We can run into him at all the time. In fact, I just had a buddy a couple weeks ago who is at uh, Wendy's on Highway 20 in Racine, and he takes a picture in the men's restroom. It says, pardon our mess. A troubled individual destroyed our men's room. It's a broken mirror. There's an automotive uh, shop in Delaware uh, a few years ago. They put this up as their sign. We fix cars better than the Patriots fix games. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Here's a really random sign that I enjoy. I was addicted to the hokey pokey, but I turned myself around. <laughs> so dumb. So signs can range anywhere from serious to interesting. Uh, they can be funny. And of course, those of us who drive every day, we have to pay attention to signs. We have to pay attention to stop signs and yield signs and do not enter signs and caution signs. Whenever I'm driving on a busy street, you know, I'll take Lake Short Drive in uh, Chicago. Um, I pay extremely close attention to the signs because if you miss your turn on a busy street in Chicago, if you miss your exit, it will be a long, painful journey before you're finally back on track, right? Because big cities are notorious for not having U-turn signs, right? U-turn permitted. You don't see these kind of signs in big cities or in congested areas. And the reason I bring this up is because the premise of this series is that it's possible to have U-turns in life. They're absolutely permitted. Now, I want to kick off our series today by asking this question. Have you ever had a person in your life, or based on your interaction with them, based on what you knew about them, based on what you saw, you realized that if they kept heading down the same road in life, like if their path remained uncorrected for too much longer, they were going to be in real trouble. Like they were going to shipwreck their lives, they were going to self-destruct in some way, they were going to not only be destructive themselves, but maybe the relationships in their, in their life. Do you know someone like that? Are they sitting with you? <laughs> right? Now, I've known several people like that, but one of the individuals I want to talk about today uh, is someone that, thankfully, I didn't really know them in that season of their life, but that would be my dad. Be my dad. Uh, this is a picture of him taking in the early 1970s, and... Uh, right out of high school. Now, he grew up in a very unstable home. His father was a decent guy, but when he would drink, uh, he would become extremely abusive. And so my dad grew up in this, this very unstable home. And it affected his relationship with his father, eventually leading to the point where there was a lot of anger in my dad. So my dad, in his uh, late teens and early 20s wasn't mean or evil, but he certainly was on a path that had a fairly predictable trajectory. And all of us carry issues from our childhood, right, into our adulthood, the baggage uh, that, that's there. And for my dad, just like any of us, there was unhealthy patterns of behavior that started to evidence themselves at this stage in his life. But then something happened. 
this picture of my dad actually is at around 25, probably 26 years old, maybe just a little bit older. I know it looks like he's part of the mafia. Um, but the fact he has a suit on here uh, tells me something happened in his life. Something significant happened in his life. He's actually going to church at this point. That's why he's wearing a suit. So my mom uh, would go to church regular, and he would join her on occasion, because he started to think, well, I want a different life for my kids than I had. Like, I want to maybe change the, 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 the family tree for my children. And he felt like maybe the way to do that is to connect with God. So he'd go on occasion, and then he started to go regularly. Well, the day came where eventually he did give his life to God. And so here he is, obviously at a stage in his life where he's already bringing his children to church. This is an exciting moment, right? The fact that, that he would put on a suit, and we don't do that here at Great Lakes, uh, but the fact that he would put on a suit and go to church and bring his family on a regular basis, that is worth celebrating, right? So if we had a, uh, what do you call these things? What? I don't know. Nobody knows. They're just a blower, right? <laughs> Party fan. I, I got it at the dollar store. <laughs> Apparently, it took a little Cialis or something. All right. Uh, but, but it's an exciting moment, right? We're, we're supposed to be celebrating, and we're supposed to be, uh, look at this, man. It's just a piece of junk. Oh, man. But it is a, it is a big deal that someone would give their life to Jesus. But the question I want to ask is, is what happens next? What happens next? And maybe that's a confusing question because maybe for you, when someone becomes a follower of Jesus, maybe for you, it's like, that's it. That's the win. That's the finish line. Well, it's really not the finish line. It's the starting line. And, and so the question that I want to ask is, is what now? Because here's what we know. New faith is fragile faith. New faith is vulnerable faith. There are a ton of people who start their spiritual journey well, but then they kind of get lost somewhere along the way. Not everybody who starts well finishes well. Which is why I'm asking the question, what now? What happens next? And that's really what this series is about. Ripple effect is not just about what happens in the moment, but it's about meaning the moment you receive God's grace in your life, but it's about the ongoing impact of your life. And so here's what we're going to do over the next several weeks. We're going to unpack just a key verse or two each week from the book of Colossians. And uh, we're going to talk about the implication of those verses. And the reason we're looking at the book of Colossians is even though we call it a book, it's really a letter. And it's a letter written by the Apostle Paul in the first century to individuals who were absolutely new to following Jesus. Okay, these were individuals living in a city called Colossae. And just so we know where Colossae is on the map, uh, here it is in modern-day Turkey. Okay, these are the people he's writing to. Now, if you're from New York, you're called a New Yorker. Right? If, you're call, if you're from uh, Wisconsin, we call you a Wisconsinite. Right? If you're from Canada, you should move. Uh, if, if you're from Colossae, we would call you a Colossian. So those are the people Paul is writing to. And just so it's more than a dot on the map to us, uh, let me give you a quick overview of Colossae. Okay, when Paul writes his letter, it is not a significant city in any way. It's actually unimportant and insignificant, a lot like Whitewater. But about 15 miles down the road are the cities of Laodicea and Hierapolis. These were two very important cities in their time. All right, they had a major highway that actually ran through the city. This connected the key points of the east to the key points of the west. Uh, in the same area, there was a large uh, theater. Um, 15,000 people in this theater. And uh, the remains of it, of course, you can visit to this day. But again, Colossae wasn't significant in and of itself. And yet something significant did happen in the city somewhere between 52 and 55 AD. And that is the message of Jesus came to the area. Epaphras, who was a co-worker of the Apostle Paul, he grew up in, in, in Colossae. And so he took some time to go back, visit his hometown, and start telling people about Jesus. And there were a whole lot of people who embraced the grace of God. Well, the Apostle Paul hears what happens at 
Colossae. He's excited for people, and he continues to hear story month after month, year after year. And so a few years after they embrace the message of Jesus, he actually writes them a letter. Now, Paul was seen as a leading authority in the church, uh, in, in many different churches in the first century. And so he writes this letter to kind of give them direction and to uh, provide a little bit of leadership. And yet when we open the book of Colossians and we look at the start of his letter, he isn't giving any leadership and he's not providing any direction. He literally just starts his letter by thanking God for these new believers. Here's what he writes. He says, we always pray for you and we give thanks to God for the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. For we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and your love for all of God's people. He says... I give thanks to God for your faith in, in Jesus. This is a group of people who went from being spiritually unborn to being spiritually born. Okay, that's what happens when we receive the grace of God in our life. We become born spiritually. It's the first step in every single person's spiritual journey. And when this happens, it's an exciting moment. Okay, it's worth celebrating. Here, I got another one. Let's see how it works. Nope. Nope. <laughs> Still, still Cialis working on these things, man. I don't know. I don't know what to say. But it is an exciting, exciting uh, moment. It's kind of like when your uh, baby or your child starts to walk for the first time, right? They're not good at it. Kind of looks like they're intoxicated. They're bound, but you're not making fun of them. It's like, you loser, walk straight, right? No, you're excited for them. You're cheering them on. You got out your camera and your, your, your uh, phone, and you're like, oh, look at this. And you let the world see. It's just a big, big moment. Well, that's how it is when someone receives God's grace into their life. And Paul says, hey, I'm thankful you received God's grace in your life. I'm also thankful that you love people. It's obvious that you're in groups. You're surrounding yourself with people who can help you mature as a follower of Jesus. But he does challenge them after his initial introduction. He says, I want you to know God has something more for you. Now, this is something that's super important for us to understand because following Jesus isn't simply about a better life later. It's about a better life now. Following Jesus isn't simply about a better life later. It's about a better life now. Paul says, I'm excited that you have faith. I'm excited that you have belief. I'm excited that you truly understand that someday you will spend eternity with God. But your faith needs to affect your life today, right now. Don't just always be thinking about the afterlife. Now, not long ago, I heard about something I never heard of before uh, called half birthday. Has anyone heard of this? Your half birthday? Where apparently if you have a birthday in the summer and you're a school, you know, you're a kid in school... So your, your birthday's August 1st, you would celebrate February 1st. Okay, I, I'm convinced we're just making up holidays now. It's like, oh, let's just celebrate to celebrate. Whatever, I think it's probably a good thing for these kids because everyone else gets to bring cupcakes on their birthday. And so this gives kids an opportunity to bring cupcakes at their half birthday and get to tell everybody I'm four and a half years old. So it's a great thing except for we're encouraging the and a half because that's annoying, right? I'm three and a half. I'm six and a half. Like, when, when does that stop, really? I'm 16 and a half. I'm 42, and I'm 42 and three quarters. That's what I am, right? But of course, we all did it as kids. And the reason we use the half age, especially when we're younger, is because we're caught in this weird in-between spot. Like we see uh, what it's like to be older, right? We, we want that because they seem to experience the fun things, right? There's a perceived like value of being older. And yet at the same time, and at the same time we realize the truth and the reality of, hey, here's where I'm at. I haven't arrived yet. And so we say we're at a half. I think it's like some Freudian thing or something. But, but it's, it's this in-between spot. And when the Apostle Paul writes to followers of Jesus, uh, this is what is on his mind. He's saying you're in this in-between spot. You've received God's grace into your life. But, but you're not in eternity with God. So, so what do you do? I mean, you're just supposed to put Nikes on and lay around the house, wait for some comet to go over you, and, and all of a sudden you'll, you'll, you know, you'll end up in heaven, get into some weird cultish stuff. No, he says we're supposed to start to experience new life right here today. 
And so Paul says, I'm thankful you've made the decision to follow Jesus, but I pray you grow in wisdom and knowledge and understanding of what God has for you. Here's why. Then the way you live will always honor and please the Lord. And your lives will produce every kind of good fruit. All the while, you will grow as you learn to know God better and better. Paul says, I'm absolutely thrilled about what's happening in your life. But let's talk about where you're headed. Let's talk about who you're becoming. He says, I pray your life will produce every kind of good fruit. Now, I'm not exactly the biggest fan of fruit. I do eat it. Uh, but Paul says, this is what I'm praying happens in your life. And the reason he uses this metaphor of fruit is because Colossae is actually located uh, at the base of a mountain. And so as the snow melts, what happens is uh, water ends up in the valley and it becomes a very fruitful place in regards to agriculture. Right? It's easy for things to grow there. And, and so the people of Colossae could absolutely relate to this analogy of fruit. They're living in an agrarian society. And so Paul writes to them and he says, I want your life to produce every kind of good fruit. And then in another letter he writes, he actually brings a lot of clarity. And he goes into detail of what good fruit looks like. Here's what he writes. He says, but when the Holy Spirit controls our lives, he will produce this kind of fruit in us. Love. We'll go back. Love. Love is... I do for you without expecting in return. Love is I treat you better than I'm even treating myself. Love is you go first. That's love. Joy. Joy is I do not find happiness in my circumstances. My emotions aren't going to be affected or, or my, my, my level of, of um uh, of joy is not going to be dictated by uh, my circumstances. My attitude is not dictated by my circumstances. And then he says peace. It produces peace in our life. Peace is I can have calm in the midst of the storm. Like it's totally possible. And then he continues. He says the fruit that God produces in our life. One of those were patience. Now I don't know about you. But this isn't easy for me to develop. And part of it is I'm just restless, right? I know very few true patient people. It's just I'm, I'm a restless individual. I pace all the time. In fact, uh, we're not doing a parenting series, so I can tell you this. Um, I was at my uh, son, who's 12 years old. I was at his musical this past week. And uh, I always get restless at these things. And we're probably 10 minutes in, and I'm looking at the program, and I'm like, how long is this going to last? So I asked my wife, how long is this? She says, two hours. I said, I'll see you later. So I got up, and uh, I walked to a part in the balcony. And no, no big deal. I didn't leave the place. Uh, but I walked to the balcony because in the balcony, I can walk around a little bit. It's completely dark up there. I can walk around a little bit. I can be on my phone. Then when my son gets up there, I can put it away and smile. Oh, yeah, there he is, right? And I can get it back. I am not making this up. I am in the balcony on my phone uh, looking at this because he's not on the stage. All the lights go out, and the spotlight comes into the section I'm sitting in. This just happened this past week. I went so red so quickly. I put down my phone. I felt like a kid who got caught from doing something wrong. Well, some of the actors had come into the section. They had a scene right there in this section. So my wife and, and, and a family friend who's with her said they were dying laughing because they knew I had totally done that to get away from people, and I did not know that's where I would end up. Okay, that's a restlessness. Paul says, listen, true fruit means you develop patience. Now, he, he's not saying you can't be restless, okay? So I want to be clear about it. He's not saying that. But he's saying in the, in the important areas of life, when you feel like, oh, I just want to take a shortcut. I want to get there the easy way. I want to get to the end prize, but not probably go the moral and ethical route that I need to go. He says, people who have good fruit in their life, they choose to take the moral and ethical route, even though often it will take a lot longer. Kindness. Kindness means I do something for you. Again, not expecting anything in return. Kindness is outward focus. Kindness says, man, I want to be a blessing to someone else. Goodness. Goodness is what's happening in my own heart. It has to do with my own character. It's, it, it, it's, it's uh, who I am when nobody's looking. All right, faithfulness. Faithfulness is I said I would do it, so I'm going to do it. 
I'm going to follow through. State of Wisconsin can't make me do it. My boss can't make me do it. My mama can't make me do it. But I said I would, so I will, because I'm going to be a person of my word. He continues. He said, what else is fruit? Gentleness. Gentleness isn't like this weakness. Gentleness is, is, is power, but it's under control. Gentleness is, I want to say the, these words with a certain tone and with a certain intensity, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it differently. Gentleness is, I, I'm going to behave in this environment and control my emotions, even though it's easy for them to get out of control. And then he actually uses the phrase self-control. And what if we skipped all of these other things that he just wrote about, and the only thing we focused on for the next 30 days was this self-control? What do you think it would do to us? First of all, we'd all get a lot healthier, right? Man, we'd be amazing husbands, amazing wives. We have self-control. There might even be some websites that would shut down, man, and run out and go out of business, right? And then he continues. He says, here there is no conflict with the law. In other words, when there's transformation taking place in our life, you don't need a bunch of rules. The, the, the need for laws, it just starts to diminish. Now, this is a really, really big deal. Paul's prayer for these new believers in Colossae is he says, I want you to produce fruit. And he knows that just because someone becomes a follower of Jesus, it doesn't mean that instantly in their life they're just producing a bunch of fruit, that they have a bunch of love and joy and patience and peace. He realizes that doesn't just happen overnight. And we need to remind ourselves of this. Because it's easy to get really frustrated and to point to people and say, oh, they wear the label follower of Jesus, but look at them. I don't see anything that's really transformational in their life. I don't see anything good happen. Well, sometimes the reason we don't see the fruit in someone's life that has embraced the grace of God is there is a difference between the grace of God and the way of God. Right? The grace of God is different than the way of God. Receiving God's grace into our life, man, that's a starting point. That's like, man, let's celebrate that, and we need God's grace every single day. No doubt about it. But there is a difference between the grace of God and then walking day by day by day in the way of God. And I know a whole lot of people, including myself, in many seasons of my life where I had this deep understanding of the grace of God but not the way of God. And so you see someone who gets baptized, and you're like, I watched her get baptized. She obviously says she follows Jesus, but I work for her. She's like the meanest person I know. How is that even possible? What's up with that? Well, what's up with that is it's possible she understood the grace of God but does not yet understand the way of God. Or, I'm in, hey, I'm in a group with him. And he reads the Bible and he comes every week and, and he even seems to have more knowledge on the Bible than the rest of us. But he just had his second affair in five years. Like, what do you do with that? Well, it's possible he understands the grace of God but really does not yet understand the way of God. So I got a teenager, my teenager, wow, they are all fired up for Jesus apparently. They go to church youth group and their, their student ministries pastor says, man, they're totally involved, but man, they won't listen to a stinking thing I say. They don't follow my authority. They don't follow the principal's authority. They don't follow the teacher's authority. They're always getting in trouble. What's up with that? Well, again, it's possible to understand the grace of God, but not yet understand the way of God. Now for me, you know who I get annoyed with? It's people who... Wear this label Christian, but are totally destructive on social media. They're mean-spirited. People who are, quite honestly, are just cruel in how they talk about the church or how they talk about people in church. People who are just mean-spirited with their comments and their criticism. In fact, if, if you do a Google search and, and you look at Yelp, we have one review on Great Lakes Church. And it is by someone who literally never attended our church. Uh, they said... I was a guest speaker at another church. I regularly go to the Seattle area and, and speak at a church. Uh, so they said this. They said, while I am touched by some of his stories, I'm highly concerned that lately his messages are condoning bullying in the church. I have no clue what this person is talking about. But they're reviewing Great Lakes Church. And when I first saw that, the spirit of Jesus did not come out of me. Right? I wanted to just, like, do some research on this woman and just start to send this. Like, what the heck? What are you? But it hit me. It's possible she understands the grace of God but does not yet understand the way of God and how to deal with whatever frustration she's dealing with. Please do not respond to that Yelp review. Here's what we need to understand, guys. Growth 
experiencing fruit in our life, that's a process. Right? When you plant a tree, it doesn't produce fruit overnight. It takes time. It's a process of planting and watering and fertilizing at times and paying attention to what's happening. You want to make sure it's getting enough sunlight. And if you don't do that, the fruit won't grow. So it's possible to have received God's grace in our life and not be producing any fruit because we really haven't yet understood the way of God. So let me ask you, when you look at your life, if you were just to be honest, and this isn't a question intended to invoke any type of shame, but when you look at your life, which of these trees represents you more? Are you someone who, for whatever reason, still have not really embraced what it looks like to follow Jesus day by day, and the way of God is not yet a part of your life? Or are you someone who is regularly growing and producing fruit? And if you say, hey, I, I look more like this tree over on the left, then let me just encourage you to find ways to connect with Jesus. Because Jesus taught this. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. Now, connecting with Jesus is going to look different for each of us. It just is. Because we're all different personalities. And we all have different ways of, of connecting. But if, if we are going to produce fruit, then we need to invest time into connecting with Jesus. And so maybe for you, it's setting aside a time and a place on a daily basis, even if it's just for a few minutes to say, I'm going I'm to quiet my heart and I'm going to try to connect with God through prayer. Maybe it's just I'm going to listen and try to kind of get a sense for the voice of God. Or, or maybe it's saying, hey, I'm going to begin to listen to worship music during my commute. I'm going to begin to fill my mind with things that broaden and enlarge my idea and my understanding of who God is. Maybe it's getting out into nature. And just clearing our mind. Maybe it's developing the habit of gratitude. You just realize, hey, I'm not a grateful person. But yet one of the great fruits of the Spirit, even though the, the word gratitude may not be listed, is being a person of gratitude. Being a person who's thankful. Maybe for me, connecting with Jesus means prioritizing a relationship with someone that I admire who follows Jesus. And I see a lot of fruit in their life. And then learning the steps that they've taken on their journey. Maybe it's developing this habit of giving because I have so much fear in my giving that really what it does is it, it, is it strengthens my faith and my trust in God. Maybe it's reading a little bit of the Bible. Maybe for us in this series, maybe it's just reading through the book of Colossians. In fact, if you go to greatlakeschurch.com and click on current series, I actually put a 28-day devotional, for lack of a better word, uh, but like a, just something that's written out from you. Uh, it's, it's from another church, and I saw it, and I'm like, dude, this is awesome. And so I, I want to make that available to you. Maybe that's what you do to connect with Jesus. But here's what we know. When we connect with Jesus regularly, we begin to produce fruit. So my dad is 25 years old, and he starts to follow Jesus. This is a big moment. Right? This is, this is a moment worth celebrating. This is a moment worth getting excited about. But it's the starting line. It's not the finish line. So what now? Because here's what we know. New faith is fragile faith. Many who start the journey get lost along the way. Maybe that's your story. So what now? Well, my dad, just like every other follower of Jesus, had to go from understanding the grace of God to the way of God, but it didn't happen overnight. It didn't just happen like that. The U-turn was a slow process, but he's been on the same path now for 40 plus years. And his decision, along with my mom's decision, to be on that path for 40 years now, allowed me to grow up in a home where I was able to see a dad and a mom who had fruit in their life, and it impacted me in such a powerful way that as I got older, I not only embraced it for myself, but I said, man, I want to give my life to seeing other people experience this in their life. And I tell you that because the reason this church exists today isn't because Dave and Rindy, back in 2008, started with a little group in, in his parents' living room. Yeah, that's part of it. But if you want to know why this church exists today, it's because of a decision my dad made when he was 20, 
five years old, which goes back to the big idea. The life of just one person can have far-reaching effects for the good or for the bad. So regardless of what your life looks like today, I'm curious what it's going to look like five years from now and ten years from now. There's a group of friends from Santa Barbara, California, just five of them, who uh, ever since their teenage years uh, would go on vacation together. So they'd go on vacation, and uh, then five years later they'd go on vacation again. And every time that they go on vacation, they take a picture of themselves. And so here, uh, here they are. They started out in 1982. Then again in 87, 92, 97, and they have the same kind of setup for themselves. 2002, 2007, 2012, 2017. They just keep taking pictures. I'm curious if we were to take a photograph today, not just of this group, but of your life individually. What will it look like five years from now? Will you have more fruit? Will you be able to say, hey, I'm growing. I'm maturing. I'm forgiving people faster. I'm holding things loose, more, more loosely than I've ever held them before. Because I realize that what I have is really not mine, it's God's. If you've received God's grace in your life, I want to cheer you on and say, way to go. But now I want to say, make sure you're not just sitting still. God has a path and a journey for you to go on. He wants fruit to be evidence in your life, and he wants it to be evidenced in my life. If you've never received God's grace in your life, uh, it's almost a, a mystery in how simple it is. He, all throughout the scriptures we read, we just need to open our hearts, and we just say, God, I, I want to embrace this. Like, I, I believe in you. I put my faith in you. And so at any moment that you want to put your faith in God and say, God, I do believe in you, and I believe that Jesus alone covers sins once and for all, and we'll talk about what that looks like from time to time here at Great Lakes, then you just literally just say, I put my faith in you. And at that moment, we celebrate and we cheer you on and we say, don't forget, it's just a starting point. It's just a starting point. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, I pray today that those who maybe have never received your grace into their life, who choose at this moment to do so, that it would become real for them today. That right here at the start of May of 2018, they would have this moment that they'll remember for the rest of their life that they received your grace into their life. And for those of us who at different seasons of our life or different points in our life maybe did open our heart to your grace, I pray help us to understand not just the grace of God, but to now begin to understand the way of God and what it looks like to follow Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.